I was a bit concerned about the, um, the, the, the comment you made, Dr. Pais, on what you're actually looking for at UCT are the most privileged black students, and then you didn't say what else, and I assumed that was filled by the white student. And so then comes in that, you're, oh, okay, I'm sorry, it, it wasn't made clear to me, I, it doesn't matter. The most privileged black students is what I'm focusing on. Because then it means to me that UCT is not actually tackling that elitist um, question and you're actually just trying to, like the man said, you're trying to put a little bit of a band-aid on a, on a huge big gaping wound. I mean, this is not gonna go away, you can't debate race if you're not thinking about class. And so the elitist question needs to be tackled. And so my question, I think it's a question, would be what is the university doing seriously to get involved in communities where it becomes necessary to not look at the race issue? So if the university, you, you keep saying, well, we don't want it to look like we're not transforming. You don't want it to look like these 90% white, 10%, whatever the figures are. Um, but then you, you still want the privilege. It's, it's, you can't have one without the other. You can't say, well, we, we only want the privilege, but we also want the black. Because the, 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 the reality is that the privileged black is a very small minority. So to my mind, it just seems sensible that universities shift away from the elite part of it and move towards the average Joe, which is the majority of the people, which in South Africa tends to be the so-called black people, and therefore you will not, over time, however much time that is, you won't need to deal with the race issue because already you've invested into, in a community that is predominantly not the right color. Or something that happened in Nazi Germany. I'd like to quote by start off by saying that prior to Nazi Germany, uh, Jews made up like something close to 6% of the population. And, but they made up 80% of the Nobel Prize winners in Germany. And what frustrated Hitler, uh, we all knew what Hitler did, what frustrated Hitler was that he saw that Jews were successful. In Rwanda, the, 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 the ethnic group that was massacred was massacred, was, was the group that was, was chosen by, by Europeans and educated. So they were somehow seen as superior. In South Africa, we know of the growing conflict between Corsas and Zulus because somehow Corsas are seen as superior or somehow see themselves as superior in politics, in business, or anything else. So what I'm saying is that if we don't use race as a proxy, what we're going to have is that we're going to have an elitist class of, 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 of white people and every black person in South Africa is going to say, I can't identify with my president because he's white. I can't identify with Tom Boardman because he's white. And there won't be any, any black people, and that's going to fuel anger. And that's what fueled the, the, the violent ethnic groups and racial, and racial conflict in those countries. It wasn't the use of race labels, but it was the, the, the disparities that existed between the races. Thank you. I, uh, right, I'm going to ask everybody, we're running out of time. So you can all, I'm going to just go from you, David, right across, and whatever you want to answer, please do in a couple of minutes. Okay, so first of all, let me address uh, Dr. Erasmus. We've had more than one debate, uh, you and I, over the course of the years, and I've actually detected a shift in your position over those times. We'd obviously have to uh, interrogate that in more detail on, on another occasion, but I don't believe that I've made a misrepresentation there. Secondly, the point that's been made last now about uh, inequality fueling violence, I endorse that entirely. I think there are twin evils here. I think that we could have a, a, a race bloodbath down the line, and I think we could have a, an economic disparity bloodbath down the line, which is exactly why we have to address both of those issues. And I think we can address them by abandoning this idea of racial classification, by not entrenching but, uh, but, but countering racial classification, and at the same time countering inequality. That's not an easy task. It's not an easy task at all. It's a very complicated thing, and I think that the country's doing rather badly uh, on that front. Then just to address what Siswe said earlier, when I gave the example of schools, uh, that was one example of one of the alternatives that we might use. And I don't pretend to have all the answers here. Uh, obviously, there are detailed empirical investigations that have to be done. But I think there's one thing to diagnose what the problem is and another thing to treat it. And it's possible to make a perfectly accurate diagnosis without pretending that you know what the solution is. The other point is that there isn't always a solution. You can have a disease. You can diagnose that disease. It might be untreatable. I'm not suggesting that's the case here. I think there's some things that we can do, but we can't do everything that needs to be done to correct this quickly. My final point is this. You've heard before of Holocaust denial. I think we have an insidious form of, of apartheid denial going on. If you think that the injustices of apartheid can be rectified in a generation or two, you're underestimating just how bad it was. 
If you recognize how bad it is, you have to recognize that we will not have a healthy and normal society for a long time to come. We have to take that long view, and we have to take the hard route, as Professor Alexander was saying. Not the quick route, but the hard route. That's not to say we can't do here in the university some things in the short run, but we mustn't overestimate what we can do to rectify those Thank problems. Thank you. Neil? I'll, I'll be just as brief. I'm not sure whether they still do this in matric exam papers, but they used to say, don't on, uh, answer the question, not the question you wish to answer. <laughs> and I think a lot of people here are, you know, imputing things to what speakers here have said, which are quite wrong. There's a lot of education that needs to take place on the issue of race, racial prejudice, and so on and so forth. And I've committed my life to doing that. I just want to make it very clear. If we talk about the danger of genocide, we are talking from bitter experience. Uh, just in May last year, two years ago, uh, we had the situation of xenophobic outbursts, which nobody expected. But anybody who studied this country would have known that that kind of thing was possible. Some of us predicted it, including myself, in books that I published. So I just want to make the point very clear that this is not a trivial matter. It's not a question of scoring points. We are talking about one of the central issues of the South African psyche, one of the central issues of South African society. And the last point uh, I want to make is that the university has got an international dimension, as Professor Ellis was saying, and there's a global curriculum, mainly in the natural sciences, but not only, which this university uh, has proved itself to be one of the major African institutions capable of living up to that particular, uh, that particular de global demand. But there's also a national side. And this is where the curriculum comes in. I don't have the time to go into it. I want to put it on the agenda for future workshops. We need to look at the agenda because those doctors that somebody spoke about on this side, uh, who have to go into the townships, who have to go into the, the uh, uh, rural areas, have got to be able to speak the language of the people and to speak science in those languages to those people, and so on. And whether they're green or black doesn't matter. I want to state that again. Whether they're green or black doesn't matter. The fact that most so-called black uh, students are very fluent at this university, very fluent in English, shows that people who are labeled white, if the incentive is there, if the pressure is there to do so, will become fluent in African languages and will be able to go into the townships, into the rural areas, and to treat people in the rural areas, in the townships. The pressure hasn't existed up to now. That is why we must change the society and change it radically. Otherwise, we're just talking.